in the disappearing margin between new choices and having no choice but to choose them lies the signature paradox of the feminist debate over new reproductive technologies. And we've seen that often today. And I have to say, um, this is one of the best conferences I've been to in ages. You know, I've learned so much today. OK. Um, which is a little intimidating. <laughs> so you have to excuse me. It makes me a little nervous. Um, OK, so one response to this situation, the um, paradox of reproductive technology, is to see it as what many believe it to be, namely, not really that different from most other political issues facing women in a highly gender and otherwise stratified society, and consequently a situation that calls for legislative change, political organization, government protection, advocacy of women's rights, and as we've seen today, um, <coughs> intelligence, wit, and an excellent sense of humor. Um, it has also been argued that feminists might have more pressing issues to worry about than infertility, IVF, ultrasound, or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Indeed, the difficult reproductive choices for women who can even afford IVF or PGD might seem most politically legible as a measure of widening health inequality. This view of IVF and its ilk as an elite gambit for which like cosmetic surgery, the rich who can pay should rightly serve as the guinea pigs for a change, may well be one of the reasons that IVF remains a virtually unregulated industry in almost every country in the world. Um, there are, of course, lots of other reasons why that's probably the case. Um, and again, um, I think Deborah Spar's book on this is incredibly helpful because what it says is that you know it is a market, and the the inability to acknowledge that it's a market is part of the problem in producing any sensible regulation, which is clearly sorely lacking in this field. Um, okay, so I suggest that part of the reevaluation of IVF should include greater consideration of its wider biopolitical implications especially now that IVF makes up as much as 5% of the birth rate in many countries. There have been more than 5 million children born from IVF worldwide since 1978, not including all of the other reproductive technologies. Um, and of course, IVF is now the gateway to new regenerative medical treatments based on human embryonic stem cell, stem cell derivation and cloning. Um, and in this way, the implications of IVF, much as they are rightly criticized as being part of an elite medical, private, global service industry, or as we sometimes call it, cervix industry. Um, <laughs> she still needs to be recognized as something, and I think this is really one of the most underestimated aspects of the history of IVF, that it's, that it's much wider implications, not only as a treatment, but as a model for treatments and as a gateway to other treatments, really needs to be recognized. I mean, the entire history of IVF is bound up with the shift of mammalian developmental biology into the human, in part as a result of radiation biology after World War II. Um, the, um, a, a much larger topic I won't get into here, but, um, but again, um, for all of the reasons we might rightly criticize IVF as being very elite and narrow, in its impact, I think increasingly it should be clear that it is something feminists have to take very seriously because of its implications for, for what I'm going to be calling later trans biology much more widely.